Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you for joining us once again. In this segment, going to have a conversation with Dr. Gustavo Kumbo. He's a board-certified interventional pulmonologist with Spectrum Health, and he's joining us on Health Professional Radio to talk about the Zephyr endobronchial valve. It's a small umbrella-like object that's placed in the airway with a, with a camera scope. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kumbo. Thank you for taking the time this evening. Thank you for the invite. Now, um, as a board-certified interventional pulmonologist, how long have you been with Spectrum Health? I joined Spectrum Health seven years ago after completing mm-hmm. training for nearly six years. And uh, we are essentially interventional pulmonologists. We are uh, specially trained in order to do um, minimally invasive procedures through camera scopes into the lungs in order to relieve obstructions or uh, be able to help patients breathe with different type of prosthesis. We're going to talk about the Zephyr valve. Now, how new is this valve? Absolutely. Uh, the Zephyr valve, uh, same as other products, have been in the product in the, in the market for quite a while. Uh, as of uh, May of last year, the FDA approved these uh, prosthesis, these uh, endobronchial valves, for the use in patients that have a severe emphysema, which is a type of condition that happens in patients that may have been exposed to uh, tobacco smoke or sometimes it's genetic. So it's been uh, a little bit over a year and um, essentially we know exactly which are the patients that benefit the most from undergoing this procedure. So the device was approved a little over a year ago by the FDA uh, approved for people with severe emphysema. Had this device uh, been used for some other type of uh, bronchial problems prior to approval by the FDA a little over a year ago? Correct. For many years, we have been using uh, this device in order to um, palliate and in order to help patients that have been uh, experiencing leaks or they have holes in the, uh, the lung ruptures or sometimes there's surgeries that don't um, allow for the patient to heal. And we used to put these valves and we still do place these endobrinkle valves in order to lessen the, the, the disease and allow the, the lungs to heal. Since we have the experience for many, many years now, and actually in Europe, this has been used for many, many years, very recently the FDA uh, cleared the use for uh, emphysema in order to perform what we call uh, endoscopic lung volume reduction. And uh, we are very proud to say that it's a very successful procedure that um, it's uh, provided at Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but uh, at least in 60 other centers in the country. You know, you mentioned that the device had been used for um, sealing leaks in the lungs or ruptures in the lungs. How does it work to alleviate the, the problems of emphysema? Absolutely. Um, those are two different conditions. To have a hole in the lung and the air escaping from the air pipes into the surrounding of the lung is one problem, which is essentially a prolonged air leak. Emphysema works differently. Essentially, if you think about somebody's lungs as a, as a balloon, uh, when the balloon grows a little larger, then takes a little real state inside of the chest. So all of those patients that have emphysema, essentially they have a condition called hyperinflation. The mechanism for which they cannot breathe is that there's some areas of the lung that inflate way more than what they should. It cannot use the oxygen that patients inhale. And unfortunately, areas that are less diseased of the lung don't have a whole lot of real state in the chest in order to use and take up the oxygen that we're bringing from the atmosphere. So by placing this prosthesis in a minimally invasive procedure, which is essentially an endoscopy called bronchoscopy, we can shut down the airflow to those areas that are diseased the most and shunt the air to areas of the lung that work better. And within a few months, the patient, for the most part, experience significant improvement of the symptoms. They can go out for dinner, they can start uh, using a little bit of less oxygen, they can uh, you know, walk the dog, they can go to the mall. And those are the little things that unfortunately patients with bad emphysema unfortunately are not able to do anymore. As far as uh, placing the device, I understand that uh, you're using a, a scope. Are we going into the lungs uh, themselves? Are we coming through the esophagus? How, how invasive uh, is the device? Absolutely, and that's a very, very good question. Um, Patients, for the most part, they're always scared of getting cut open, of bleeding, and not being in control. This is a procedure that takes roughly half an hour. The first part of the procedure is a lot of detective work. We make the patient sleepy, uh, an anesthesiologist provides a general anesthetic in order for the patient not to be aware of anything, completely relaxed, pain-free. We put a small breathing tube from the mouth into the main air pipe called the trachea, 
And mm -hmm. after uh, we secure this uh, breathing device, we place a very small camera scope called bronchoscope, bronchos from the area that we're going to be working and scope for being able to see. So this bronchoscope goes through the endotracheal tube into the main air pipes. And then I do a little bit of detective work in which I use a computer to simulate what would happen if I place the valves. After the computer gives me the thumbs up in which the candidate or the patient that is on the table will welcome these valves and will uh, essentially will make, uh, will produce the, the desired effect. Then I take the balloon out and I place very, very, very small prosthesis called endobronchial valves. And I may put one, three, five, as many as I need. And after a successful procedure, we remove the camera scope, we remove the endotracheal tube, and essentially the patient stays in, with us in the hospital for a couple of days being observed. At the, uh, at the least, the patient has a little bit of a sore throat from the procedure. And at the most, uh, patients sometimes can experience a collapsed lung. And that's the reason why we keep them in the hospital very under very close observation. Now, just to put things into perspective for our listeners, uh, until now, how did you alleviate the problems associated with severe emphysema? What were the only options? And that's a very, very good question. Unfortunately, there was a gap, a very, very wide gap. We have the patients that uh, they have emphysema, COPD, and uh, usually we start with some puffers, then we provide the patients with some oxygen, and then we have patients attend pulmonary rehabilitation. Once they maximize the, this type of medical treatment, unfortunately, there was no bridge therapy other than going directly into a lung transplantation or a rough surgery called endosco uh, sorry, um, a surgical lung volume reduction. Essentially, um, a few years ago, the only way to lessen the hyperinflation and take out of patients areas that were not working of the lung was by a surgery to take out that area that was diseased or replace one or both lungs. Those are surgical approaches that patients sometimes are not strong enough to endure. And unfortunately, the complications of those two procedures are significant. And when patients chose not to go the surgical route, unfortunately, we were talking about end-of-life palliative hospice approach. The endobronchial valve fills that gap. Patients that maximize medical treatment and do not wish to undergo a surgical procedure. And I'm glad to say that this is, uh, for the most part, a procedure that um, it's, it's relatively safe and, and our patients are, are very, very satisfied. And uh, for the most part, it's, it's something that patients, if I, they have to do it all over again, I would say that they would, would they would go. How many of the centers are actually performing this particular procedure? I know you've got lots of centers uh, around the country. Are all of your uh, center, uh, centers there uh, performing this procedure? Right. That's a very good question. There's a few centers that are essentially centers with higher volume. Like everything else, the more you do something, the better you get. And um, uh, I would say that roughly 60 centers in the country provide this. There's only two centers in Michigan that they provide it. One is in the east side of the state, and we are at the uh, west side of the state in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, we have done uh, 10 cases to date, and our patients are doing really, really well. We didn't have um, a whole lot of problems. Obviously, the patients don't appreciate to stay in the hospital for a couple of days. They want to go home right away. Mm -hmm. But as a precaution, we keep them there, and, uh, and we learned that there's a lot of safety nets that we deploy. Luckily, we don't have to resort to any of these things uh, oftentimes. So I would say the answer is 60 centers, two in Michigan. And uh, for the most part, I would say that this is going strong. And I expect this to continue growing to hopefully soon be a main stem and, and, and hopefully be part of the guidelines for the management of COPD. Where can our listeners go and learn some more about Spectrum Health and the procedure and the products? Right. We, we have um, a office, a, a general pulmonary office in Spectrum Health. The number to be reached um, is a 616 Two six seven eight two four four. Those are the main lines. Oftentimes, we like patients to be evaluated by a general pulmonologist to make sure that we're not jumping the gun. We want to make sure the patient has the best treatment possible for the COPD that they have. We want to make sure that they have maximized the non-invasive procedures or the non-invasive approaches, uh, as in oxygen and pulmonary rehab. Once our general pulmonologists decide that the patient maxed out on the conservative approaches, then a general pulmonologist would reach out to us directly. Dr. Egan is the other interventional pulmonologist alongside with me. And then we'll be more than glad to shake hands, explain things to the dot, and uh, 
after we go over a few hoops and loops, uh, additional testing that we want to make sure that takes place so this, we don't provide the, the right procedure to the wrong patient. Uh, and once we go through a couple of hoops and loops, then um, we do our very best to schedule right away, and hopefully the patient has a really good outcome, which is really what they look forward to. Thank you, Dr. Kumbo. Thank you for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. Find more online at www.spectrumhealth.org. It's been a pleasure, doctor. Thank you very much for your time. Look forward to the next one. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.